Um, this is the lady from my German group that I haven't been to in a year. Uh, she right. still keeps me on the mail. I'm glad you remember her. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mrs. What's her name? Mm. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wouldn't miss this for anything. Well, thank you. I'm glad you came. Um, I'm Millie Walker. I used to be the curator at Dr. Pepper Museum, and right now I'm the historian for uh, First Presbyterian Church. I, uh, I have a large collection of, of antique Sunday school books, and I found out they had stopped publication of it up in the 60s, so I found the publisher, and I told him, please send all of the last book, and please send it to Millie Walker, archivist, First Presbyterian Church, Waco, and when it came, it was addressed to Billy Walker Activist, First <laughs> Presbyterian <laughs> Church, Waco. Well, what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> That's true, too. Um, and, and so I came back to church the next day, and they had Billy Walker Activist on the door of the archive. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I decided that the first thing I ought to do was tell a little bit about who was the church staff and explain some things. Dr. Tom Gallagher was the pastor then, and Julian Huffer was the director of Christian Education, that's VCE. And Miss Lena Clausell had an office in our church, and she was the Presbytery Director of Christian Education. And her office was up on the second floor above what is now the pastor's office. Mrs. Ethel Mullen was the church secretary, and Dave Hastings was our church custodian. And he and his wife, Jenner, kept our church just immaculate. They were great. Um, I wanted you to just get in your mind where my church is. This is First Presbyterian Church. This was Compton Funeral Home. Uh, and you could look across the street from the church and see the funeral home. The, uh, this was a little house, and it was being used by the church for Sunday school. Come in, Dorothy. No. Hey. You know oh, where First Presbyterian Church is, so you have missed it. She's a badass, but she knows where it is. <laughs> well, well, I wanted to. I found this picture in one of these books up here, and I thought it was a, a really good example of where the tornado path was. Now, it didn't start in Bells Hill. It started way out in Arena. And it came across like this, but when it got down to this is Fifth Street, and red, this red line is Austin Avenue. When it got here, this is the church down here, right on that corner. When it got down here, the winds took it like straight up Fifth Street, and then it just sort of took a left, a right-hand turn at the Amicable Building and went on across the river and all the way out, this is the county map up here, to Axel, 27 miles. That's a long track. Okay. It was a terrible tornado. The May 11, 1953 tornado tops the list of, of the most terrible storms since 1900. It was an F5 with winds reaching 260 miles an hour. Killed 114 people, injured 597, destroyed about 600 homes and other buildings, and damaged over 1,000. 2,000 vehicles were also destroyed, many from brick walls that just collapsed onto the street. Some of the survivors had to wait up to 14 hours to be rescued. It passed through the downtown area near the end of the work day. I couldn't find a picture of the clock. I wanted to put the clock in, but I, I know it's out there, but I just didn't find it. The clock is the one that's on the first National Bank camera. Yes. That's what you're talking about. 
which figures in my story here in a minute. Uh, many people were unaware of the impending severe weather, and it just started pouring rain. And the tornado came down over Laredo, moved north northeast toward Waco, it was approximately a third of a mile wide, and the rain, which eventually measured seven and a half inches, was so heavy that nobody saw the tornado. People went into banks, stores, movie theaters, and uh, down to other downtown buildings to get out of the rain. Now we were about, uh, First Presbyterian Church was about a block and a half from where the major damage started. The tornado swept through Bells Hills area, struck the downtown area, moved almost directly south to north, and 30 people died when a single building dropped from six floors down to two floors in height, the R.T. Dennis building. And that was really important to us because R.T. Dennis uh, in 1911 had given the copper box in which all of the cornerstone things were put when the cornerstone was laid of First Presbyterian Church. So R.T. Dennis, that would have been an important thing for us. What year? What year was that cornerstone laid? 1911. 1911. Uh -huh. And the pageant building, which was directly behind the Dennis building, was also destroyed. And then, of course, bricks rained down on cars from the walls and the roofing materials flew through the air. And the twister continued on a northeasterly path, finally dissipating out of Axel. Did you all realize that Sunday, May the 10th, was Mother's Day in 1953? Well, Monday morning dawned with gray skies. Our minister, Dr. Gallagher, had gone to uh, Mo Ranch Presbyterian Assembly, which is down a little bit northeast of Kerrville. And honey, in 1953, you didn't have but one car. So he left his car with his wife and two children, and he rode down to Mo Ranch with somebody else. Um, Ethel Mullen, the church secretary, and Julian Huffer and uh, Lena Clausell, the DCDs, worked all day long. It was Monday, so Dave Hastings was in the church cleaning and sweeping and picking up bulletins that were on the floor and that had been left in the pews, and they still do that. And uh, he had ridden down to, to Mo with uh, another board member, and uh, it was a very quiet, Monday morning. On Saturday following the tornado, Julian Huffer wrote a letter. And he says in his letter, I've always said I would never send the same letter to everybody, but this time I feel justified in breaking my resolution. It's the easiest thing to do since there are so many things to say. Even now, I'm not sure that any letter will make sense or that I can think straight enough to write. The best place to start, I guess, is with Monday afternoon. It seems as if time has stood still, and even now most everybody has to stop and try to remember what day it is. As for hours, they meant nothing. One just forgets about a watch or anything else. Monday morning, dawn with gray skies, the beginning of a usual week and a usual day. Morning passed and lunchtime came. So we went downtown to eat and afterwards made trips to the bank at 5th and Austin. And that was about 2 o'clock. Finally returned to the office where I made and received some phone calls. I finished preparations for an important meeting I had scheduled Monday night. I don't think you made that meeting. And then began work on a talk which I'm to give later at Austin and the Hale. Dave the janitor came in and asked if I'd heard about a warning of a possible tornado. Well, that started it. And all of us went outside and watched the clouds, which were dark and boiling. It was quiet, and there was no breeze. 
Compton Funeral Home, across the street from us, had put most of their vehicles in the garage, and the men were outside too, watching. What to do with our cars became a problem since we only had a parking lot. By this time, Lena and Dave and I were the only ones left at church. Mrs. Mullen had gone home. We decided to move our cars away from the building, so we drove them up onto the center of the parking lot. Now, I'll show you in a minute. The parking lot was up a slope. All of that was dug out flat where we put the parking lot we currently have. So I then tried to contact the Weather Bureau, but the lines were jammed, so I called radio station WACO, and they said the latest report they had was 12 o'clock, it was now 3.30, and that at that time there was no danger. At 4, or sometime about then, I contacted the Weather Bureau, and they gave me the following. Local thunderstorms, severe in some places, back up, you went too far. There it is. Local thunderstorms, severe in some places, some hail, no cause for alarm. Dave decided to go home after hearing that, but Lena and I decided we would work longer and eat downtown after the storm. I went back to my office, which is located on the 11th Street side, the southeast corner of the building. From it, you get a good view looking southeast since it's all windows. I tried to work, typing the speech, and Lena finally came in. It became darker and darker. Soon the clouds began lifting in the south, but they were horrible looking. As we came closer and the wind began to increase and watching the cloud edges, one could see them breaking down then rising, only to boil and lower and drop again. One section gave way and then rose to the east another section, and it did not rise. We never did see a funnel, but we supposed that that was it. Suddenly, the wind and rain came from the north down 11th Street from Austin to Franklin and it lasted only a few minutes. And then back it came up 11th Street. The sign on the old Franklin apartments behind the church stood straight out, and the wind and rain became more and more intense, and then the lights went out. We pulled the munition lines closed and left my office, going into the session room. They went from a room that had windows on two sides to a room that had windows on one side. The lights went out, we pulled the initial blinds closed, and we looked out of the windows in the session room. All at once, the wind had a sound I shall never forget, a sucking sound. And outside, the rain whirled and whirled. Slate from the church roof began to give way, go round and round, finally landing, but fortunately not hitting our car. The wind began rocking the cars on one side, lifting them a little. If it had been a little stronger or more severe, they would have rolled into the street where they were parked on a slope. I thought sure they would go, and I also thought the storm would never end. It seemed to get worse and worse. Finally, there was nothing but rain, and then very little of that. We left immediately for home, not knowing what we would find. Outside, we tried to clear the lot from nails and slates so we could drive out. The streets were littered with huge tree limbs. A bench which had been at the corner of 11th and Austin at the bus stop was now at the corner of 11th and Franklin, a block down. I went out Austin hearing and meeting fire trucks and ambulances. I saw a friend who was on the sidewalk and I stopped was told that they thought two or three buildings downtown had collapsed. It still didn't register. At home, I found everything in order, so I went immediately to the Stromberg's friends of mine. Ed had just reached home from his office where he stayed during the storm. He has an office on 6th Street, just off Austin, and his car was parked there on the street. 
The back glass of his car was shattered and one section gone completely. Rocks were inside and the paint scraped off where flying gravel and debris had hit it. All radio stations were off the air, so we couldn't get any news. But from what Ed had seen, it sounded bad. We left almost immediately for his office in order to see what damage there may have been. Parking at the church, we walked downtown Beginning one and a half blocks from the church, the real damage started. All windows and stores gone. Signs twisted into shapes you cannot imagine. Awnings torn in shreds and completely gone. Bricks and all matter of debris littered the streets. The further down we went, the worse it became. Escaping gas filled the downtown area. Cars were parked and their tops crushed from bricks. Finally, we reached his office. Already they were digging in the debris. His office, though in the heart of the area, was in good shape except for upstairs. I hear it is now condemned. The National Guard had been called out and the Air Force from James Conley plus the Army and Navy Reserves were helping. There was no light, and it continued to rain. Lightning was plentiful, and the thunder rolled. It felt as if you were in a canyon or a ghost town. Cordons were thrown across the streets, moving people out of the area, and sound trucks continually warned of the gas and called for evacuation of the area. We left and went back to church. All communications were jammed, and it was impossible to call out. I managed to get a wire out by a person going to Dallas letting you folks at home know I was all right, otherwise you wouldn't have heard. It was horrible. We went back to Ed's and listened to the radio, which finally got back in operation, since there was nothing anyone could do. It was miserable to sit and listen to calls saying that so-and-so was missing, and later to hear of the body being found. Most of the activities centered on the R.T. Dennis building and two others in the block where they knew some were still alive. Calls for equipment, clothing for workers, floodlights, flashlights, and still it rained with the sky getting lighter at intervals. The sea was in darkness as far as streetlights were concerned. The bodies of two high school boys, not members of our group, but ones who had attended several times were found late that night. I think those were the two boys that were at the swimming pool. Okay. To sit and listen to it was a nightmare, not knowing who would be found next. In the absence of Dr. Gallagher, I called the Red Cross and offered our building as a shelter. And then I called and alerted some of the women for possible help. It wasn't needed, and very early Tuesday morning, I went home and went to bed, slept restlessly, was up shortly, went to the church but couldn't do anything, went to Ed's and stayed till late afternoon. That evening, we carried clothing to the Red Cross and food. From there, we took some workers to City Hall in the center of the disaster area, approaching it from another direction, passing armed guards, and on down made you a little more conscious of what had happened. Through demolished areas, between destroyed buildings, over streets littered with debris, and onto the city hall on the square, arriving city hall looked like a shell of a building. All the windows gone, munition lines hanging out in twisted formations. Some buildings completely collapsed, most of them. Others with roofs caved in, and only the walls standing. Nothing was left untouched. The ambulances screamed. Here someone called for a cutting torch, indicating the finding of a body. At Compton's, the funeral home across from the church, a steady stream of hearses, ambulances, even pickup trucks, deposited the victims, and they were placed head to foot in the garage on boards. Floodlights played on the dentist building and the work of going through it brick by brick, piece by piece, went on. 
Occasionally, a person still alive was found. Tuesday night, they had only gone through about half of it and still could not reach the basement where they hoped to find more. And the water began filling the basement and they called for pumps hoping to keep those who might be still alive from drowning. Time continued as it does now to stand still. There was never a morning, an afternoon, or a night, and the days seemed not to change. It was the same time all the time. People who could not go into the disaster area did not and still have not realized the damage and how horrible it is. To say nothing of the wide area of town covered. It's compared by some Air Force officers with bombed cities, and most say it's worse than some they've seen. Wednesday night, I worked at City Hall, light in the building, but total darkness outside, except for the floodlights on the RT Dennis building. Still, the rain and thunder went on. As some have described it, the thunder played a dirge over the city as the search continued. The city was truly one of death, and you felt it pressing in on every side. The cities of Texas and over the nation have been wonderful. They have sent clothing, food, money, laborers, ambulances, doctors, nurses, even morticians. Van loads of materials have poured into the city. Money is pouring in. The funerals continue on an around-the-clock basis for the toll now stands at 113. And still, people are missing. Much has been accomplished since Monday toward clearing the debris, but it will be a long time before it is ever the same. As I write, it is Saturday and still raining. He goes on down here to say a lot of things just started to dawn on us on Saturday. And one of them was, which I think was a scare him to death, was that they were actually in the tornado. So where was Dr. Gallagher when all this occurred? And he didn't know what was happening because there wasn't any radio work. Back up. You went too far. This is the Joy Theater, and it's showing a wonderful movie called The Lusty Man uh, with Robert Mitchum. And the Joy Theater was right next to the R.T. Dennis building. Is that right? It was, <coughs> yes. The building right here to the right was R.T. Dennis. The building on this side of the Joy was the Chris's Cafe. Chris's Cafe. Um, this photograph appeared in 2003 in the newspaper. It says, uh, and of course the World War II veterans compared Waco's devastation to bomb cities. It says the old Paget building is in the foreground, Austin Avenue is on the right. I don't think so. It doesn't look right to me. Wilton, how does that look to you? Well, it's a, it's a different perspective. This is, I think, this street right here. And the thing that I've learned through some of these other lectures is that when the tornado came down and, and Padgett's had a basement, this picture was taken uh, maybe a week or so later because they- So is this the basement area? That's the basement. That's of right. No, that's, well, basement of Padgett's and Dennis Pope. Uh, this would be an alley here, and I, I can't, from this perspective, one of the things you have to think about when you look at one of these pictures is how did the photographer get that perspective, where yeah. was he? And most of the pictures were taken from the Amical building looking down, but the building that is now the Waco ISD administration building was across the street diagonally there. Uh, the, this to me looks like uh, some of the, the dentists, the floors. There were, there well, was five, what, there were five floors, but they all laid down like a deck of cards, really. Mm -hmm. And then they had to peel them back. And you mentioned 
the last person uh, that was dug out was Lily Bankin. Uh huh. And she was the elevator operator, and she was pinned in there, and she kept hollering for help. And when they got to her, she, she said, "I sounded like a man by that time." My voice. Because her voice had all gone. That's right. And she uh -huh. said, "I prayed to God to." If it be his will to go ahead and let me go home, or if not, let me out. And Dr. Uh, uh, Johnson? No, it was a Jewish uh, Dr. Uh, Aubrey Goodman. Good, Dr. Goodman. Was, they slipped oxygen on a tube and through a hole to, so she could breathe. And uh, uh, now this picture here, which was the day after the tornado, see, May the 12th. Yeah, this is Tuesday. Yeah, and uh, uh, you really, it's, you can see this 60 by that time, uh, and it is right, every building in the uh, heart of the city was hit. The interesting thing is, that between Fifth Street, which we're sitting on right here, and now we're building sitting on two blocks up, and Fourth Street, every building was destroyed. The the paramountains that were the Arctic Dennis and Pegasus, they were the largest. But all the way down Franklin, they were all gone. All the way down Austin Avenue, we looked at uh, the Joy Theater. But you would have looked at uh, except the Roosevelt Cafe, Hotel. everything except the Roosevelt Hotel. And, and, the Roosevelt, and something I read said the the Ankle Building and the Roosevelt Hotel and the City Hall were modern construction. That's what's correct. Was that's steel, correct. and and that's what kept them. That's what kept them from going down. Well, this is Tuesday morning's paper. I just uh, I took this off the microfilm at the library, and you can see that it is a very well used piece of microfilm. That looks like City Hall. Yeah, it is. It's right here. And then this is Wednesday morning's paper. That's reached 88. It got up to 114. Well, what happened to Dr. Gallagher? Well, he also wrote a letter, which I, I just want to read you a little snip of it. Uh, he was down there, and when it struck, Alan and children, Sally and Tommy, were in complete safety. He tells them that up front. And we have not been endangered in the least. We are, of course, thankful to God for that. They could have been downtown at the time the storm struck, just like anyone else who was there and was injured or killed. I was at a board meeting of Mo Ranch at the Presbyterian Mo Ranch Assembly, about 25 miles northwest of Kerrville. When the first stories began to filter through the radio, I, of course, began to think of a way home since I had not brought the car and he couldn't call in. So Mr. West and Mr. Klein were kind enough to insist that I take the great ranch station wagon. I could have and would have insisted but had it been necessary, and, and come on in to Waco. After a flight in which I slowed down to 60 through the larger towns, <laughs> I got in at a little before 3 a.m. to find that Mrs. Gallagher and the children were all safe. Now, oh, Millie, that picture right there that you've got on the screen, okay? Right uh -huh. here in the bottom, it says Ed Berry found in Ruins. Uh -huh. Ed Berry and Rush Berry were the owners of R.T. Dennis, mm -hmm. and they, along with the largest number of people, were killed. They were Columbus Avenue uh, folks, and there were 13 members of Columbus Avenue that were killed in the tornado. Yes, and, and the, the Waco paper, in reporting the 60th anniversary, Named their minister as the minister of First Presbyterian Church, but he wasn't. So. <laughs> it was W.W. W. Melton who was 75 years old, and for three days he ended up conducting those 13 funerals. And said it for a half. I bet you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'll show you some more pictures of the damage here. This was Mecca drug. Um, notice these little bottles on the wall. 
and then all this destruction around it. Um, I came up with this photograph just recently, and it's just sort of inserted it in. This is R.T. Davis building here in the Joy Theater, and uh, you can kind of see the alley going through there. And then all these buildings were lost. Well, it just this building was first federal right here, and that's now that was Barnett uh, Printing Company. It is now a beverage uh, dispenser called Barnett's Pub. Okay. And but if you look this building is, is a uh, parking lot, and this building is diagonally across from the Dr. Pepper Museum. And, and, and the right, sure right there. Tests. And there's, this, this I, thought, I can see, see Millie waving out the window up here on the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> we came to the, the we came to Waco the year after the tornado, and I grew up in Tornado Alley, and we used to drive downtown to shop on a real stormy day because you could park any place in Waco you wanted to park on the main street, right in front of the store. The problem was when you went in, there wasn't anybody to wait on you. They were all in the back of the building. <laughs> Whenever a storm came, and I worked at night in Austin, uh, whenever the clouds and the storm came, people went and got on the bus or in their car and left for, for several years. Yeah. Well, this is the, uh, what the tornado was reported as. Uh, this is May 13th. This is what they thought, five miles long. This is a picture of First Presbyterian Church from that time period. Um, I thank the Texas Collection for this photograph. Um, notice the apartment building on the corner behind the church. This was Franklin Apartments. And you see this slope? This is the drive up into the parking lot behind the, the church buildings. This is Julian Huffer's office, this corner one. This was the session room, and this was uh, Dr. Gallagher's office and Lena Clausell was up here. Her office was up there. Well, you went too far. This is the Gallagher family, Sally and Tommy and Dr. Gallagher and Alma. Here's Dave. Dave was so busy uh, starting on uh, Tuesday morning. He was sweeping the church. There, there had been so much rain that there was water in the fellowship hall and he had to sweep that out. Then he had to go out in the parking lot and say, no, you can't park here. This is for the church and the police and the highway department. And then he had to come downstairs and make coffee. And he went for two days and two nights without sleep. He's never left the church. Um, I don't know what that is. That's something I didn't intend to do. Now, did okay. Presbyterians drink that much coffee? <laughs> uh, Presbyterians drink a lot of coffee. Okay. This is R.W. Waddy Williams on the left and J.L. Sleeper. Mr. Sleeper had a, a grain and feed store. And this is another one of those curiosities of a tornado. Here's some sacks just stacked up there. In all this destruction, he's waiting for uh, the uh, insurance adjuster to come. Tom spent a great deal of time visiting with the police and the highway patrol. Uh, Sergeant Farley on the right hand side is a highway patrolman. Uh, Sergeant Farley is in the middle. Jesse Reed from the highway department. And, uh, they came out and brought coffee to the uh, barricades, which they hoped to keep people from crossing. Even the high school kids got in it. This is uh, James Brown. I don't have this photograph in the archives. Um, the, the ones that look like they're from a newspaper came out of the Presbyterian News. Um, and uh, I don't know who fed them the pictures, but uh, if they were supposed to be part of ours, they didn't get back to the church. He uh, 
was a high school boy and he worked in the um, courthouse. He also worked at the radio station and they were, the school was closed for a week so they were busy. Um, also, a man named Ed Walker, who was the future treasurer of First Presbyterian Church, was at the Y when the tornado struck. And they started making coffee. And he would put the big urn in his car and drive it down to the corner of Fifth, as close as he could get, and deliver that, and bring an empty one back. And he spent a day doing that, just going back and forth delivering coffee. And he wasn't the only one. Lots of lots of people did that. Did you know that Ed Walker? I didn't know that Ed Walker. He's related to a bunch of people in this room. <laughs> this is Janie Williams. Uh, she was a senior high school student. Um, and they took this nice picture of her, excuse me, delivering uh, food. This is the kitchen crew. Um, I didn't know any of the ladies in this, and I found in my archives another photograph. Now, these ladies are lined up. They are the same ladies who turned around on the 100th anniversary of the church in 1955. That was two years later. And produced a wonderful 100th anniversary dinner. And uh, they are left to right, Mrs. Ben Peek, Mrs. Herman Helmuth, Mrs. Ed Newman, Mrs. E.J. Fletcher, chairman of this committee, Mrs. J.E. Cruz, Mrs. C.E. Barnwell, Mrs. Vernon Cole, and Mrs. E.A. Werner. Mrs. Werner's husband was the choir director of our church. This is Miss Loretta Webb standing on this side of the food. And this is Alma Gallagher back here. The Red Cross people, when they came, would not take free food. They insisted that they would pay for their lunches. Thank you very much. This is a very tired Carl Snyder. Carl owned two drugstores in downtown Waco, and apparently they were not damaged. And he ended up uh, coordinating the emergency uh, supply, medical supplies and drugs for the city. I think he lives worn to a thread, goodness sakes. The Rainbow Girls took over the uh, business of, of uh, washing the dishes. We didn't have paper plates, we didn't have plastic cups, we didn't have styrofoam mugs. And uh, we had to wash and keep clean because we were feeding people who came in. And uh, so the Boy Scout troop came in, and the Boy Scouts started mopping the basement and picking up the dishes and bringing them into the kitchen so they could be washed. They planted a sign on the front of the church so that people would know where to go. And the church uh, gave them quite a large number of Sunday school rooms uh, on, on the uh, ground floor, what they call the first floor, what I call the basement of the church. And they uh, didn't let the public go above that, but they had storage upstairs and they had people upstairs working. Um, emergency shelters had already been established at four other locations. And the Red Cross staff at the church was especially trying to help victims toward rehabilitation. So I'm thinking that the other, four, the other locations had different things going on. The, this is a picture of Mr. Pierpont. Well, this is to tell you where to go. Go to First Presbyterian Church to get it. Uh, if your house was destroyed. This is Mr. Robert Pierpont. He came to Waco <clears throat> with 21 staff members from Washington. When he got here, 
he went around to all the social agencies and picked up 20 more volunteers. And then he put them all in Red Cross uniforms and, and set them out to work. The Red Cross switchboard ended up at the bottom of the stairs at First Press Church, and the little sign says, do not go upstairs. And uh, uh, left to right are Miss Ion Killo, Mrs. Hollis Vassar, and Mrs. Frank Stevens. This is Miss Beulah Miles, Miss Helen Flanagan, and Miss Edna Vinberg. Um, this is uh, one of the ground floor offices, and uh, they must have just worked day and night. Uh, here's another one of those photographs that I didn't have that came in there. Miss Grace Kirby. Um, I, I, I had to read that last sentence two or three times to figure out what she was doing. She was processing forms, dispersing requisitions. It's, it's an odd sentence. Okay. This was upstairs in the church. They were checking supplies. William B. Sherman, an accountant for the National Red Cross and Al Parsons of Waco. Um, and they they took uh, Ms. Clausell's office and made it into a, a, a storage room for supplies. And I, I looked at this and I, I was telling a friend of mine about it. And I said every package was tied in string. Not we're not allowed to do that anymore. All right, with her back to us is Anna Jeans. She was very active in First Press, and I thank this, this man for going around to the other side to show you Angela's face. Um, registering Families was one of the things that they did, and they just did a hundred or two hundred in a day. That's just amazing to me. Uh, interviewing, caseworkers interviewed with them and talked to them, and uh, they asked, they asked, uh, what, what are we going to do? We don't have a house, and they would get all the interview down, and then they would send them to a place to spend the night and work toward rehabilitation. This is Mrs. Castaneda. I lost one. There it is. This is Mrs. Castaneda. Uh, Mrs. Knapp was the senior <coughs> sponsor at First Press at that time. A lot of interesting stories came out during this time. Uh, this is Ms. the Reverend and Mrs. Rogerio uh, with Joel and Iris, their children. A man in Lima, Peru sent a letter with a check for $25. He said a few years before his son had suffered a dormitory fire at Oklahoma University and our church had sent money so he was returning the favor to our church. Here's Dr. Johnson visiting with Tom at the hospital. Uh, he was buried under debris for three hours and uh, and he, is a, he was an eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist. And when his building was demolished, his nurse was in the next room. She died, but he talked to her through the wall until she died. And that would not have been dug out probably, but his wife came down there and said, dig here, and they found it. There was another person in there working in Ted Lucinet. And Ted Lucinay and Dr. Johnson would talk to the nurse, but she bled to death before they could get to yeah. To the back corner on the alley of the Patrick Building is where this, they worked at that time. That's something else. The Salvation Army was wonderful. They gave them a warehouse. And in this photograph, they're sorting clothes according to size, use, and season. 
And then after they had been sorted, they turned around and gave these boxes of clothing to the other churches. And uh, to the churches also sent volunteers. I'm not to say that, that all of these folks were from, from First Presbyterian Church. There were a lot of considerations for the pastor once he got back. Um, he came back to find that, that the Red Cross had accepted the invitation to, to have housing in their church. And apparently four other churches in the downtown area did too. And he thought, what am I going to do about a sermon Sunday? Well, do you all remember that paper used to have a side? One side was finished, the other side was not. You wanted to print on the finished side mm -hmm. because if you didn't, your ink would just feather. Well, they had always, First Press had always had their, certain, their bulletins printed by printing hats. So they were required, there wasn't anything functioning. So they decided they would mimeograph. And they mimeographed the church, the order of service on the soft side. And uh, this, this was kind of interesting. He writes in his letter, uh, Dr. Gallagher wrote it in his letter, what do you all think I ought to give a sermon on? I mean, what text should I use? And, uh, uh, and what hymns should I use? Now this was 1953. They were using the 1927 and the hymn that they chose, he chose, well, the responsive reading was from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he had climbed unto me and heard my cry. And the scripture lesson was Luke 13, 1 to 9, a text on repentance. And the hymn was Fountain of Grace, Rich, Full, and Free. And he titled his sermon, Meditations at a Ruined Building. Um, it must have been they, they had decided by this time they would cancel everything except the Sunday service morning and afternoon and it was actually Ascension Day so they had the Waco Commander in number 10 Ives Templar and the sermon for the evening was full circle followed by text of Acts 1 9 and Hebrews 4 4. On the back of the, of the bulletin, see how neat that is? That's the finished side of the paper. And one of the things that struck me was number six. The first Presbyterian Church of Texas City, the recipient of help during their tragedy. Bank, 1947, and a boat full of what? Ammonium nitrite. Yep. Boy, don't we know about ammonium nitrite. And it was close to home this time. But they offered food, money, and people because we sent them food, money, and people. We now have in the Presbyterian Church a Presbyterian Disaster Relief uh, committee, which is a large national committee that they go all around. I want you to see this on the bottom down here, this brown stuff. I found this is the only bulletin I have from that Sunday, and I found it in the Women of the Church scrapbook. And I'm going to tell you what kind of glue it was. Do you all remember when glue came in a little bottle like this and had like a little rubber tip like a lipstick? Mucilage? Yes. That's what that is. And I want you to know that everything that lady used mucilage to glue down, as I turned the pages, it fell off the page. I'm so thankful that I can have this one bullet. <laughs> but it will have to go back in that scrapbook. 
There, there were a lot of other things that happened that I think are kind of interesting and I'd like to pass on to you. The final death date, the death list, had 114. And 145 listed with major injuries, 952 with less serious ones. 2,000 families reported to have suffered loss of some sort. About 2,000 automobiles were damaged, many of them demolished by falling debris. Estimates of damage to buildings and other material possessions ran from 21 million to 36 million. Total losses, including those resulting from deaths, injuries, unemployment, ran at 41 million to 63 million. A year later, the consensus of those in a position to know, I wonder who that was, was that the total damage was approximately 51 million. I don't know what that would be in current that, that dollars. Kind of is the one that stuck. And uh, uh, Joy and I were, I, I went to see what she could tell me about what $51 million would be today. And it was what, did, what it, did it come up? About half a billion. Half a million, five hundred million, five hundred thousand million. Ooh. Well, what was everybody doing? Not just First Presbyterian Church, but the other churches and the other religious groups uh, lent their buildings a great deal. The East Waco Church of Christ, uh, which was located in the disaster area, received only minor damage. They turned one of their buildings into a relief storeroom, collecting food, clothing, and bedding, and dispensed them to about 200 families. Wesley Methodist, though damaged, served as a relief station. St. Francis Mission, um, which is just west of the damaged area, continued its own work for two weeks after the disaster, hosting 33 people and feeding 70 people every day. Um, St. Paul's Episcopal opened its church kitchen on the night of the disaster, served coffee to the police and the National Guard, the next day turned it into an emergency housing unit with cots supplied by the American Red Cross. More than 100 meals a day were served for four days, and thousands of sandwiches were made in the church kitchen. I imagine every church kitchen in the area was turning sandwiches out like mad. Seventh and James Baptist Church um, uh, opened its doors to 70 Latin Americans who were members of one of its missions in East Waco and who lived, lived at the church for about three days. And uh, a majority of the pastors used the disaster as a theme for their Sunday sermon following the tornado. Uh, and I have, I have highlighted here Dr. W. W. Melton of <laughs> Columbus Avenue conducted 13 funerals during the four days following the disaster and in an interview reported in the Waco Times Herald for May 17th, he says it's been the worst strain I have ever passed through. I think probably... You were two blocks from Columbus Avenue. Uh-huh. And the basement, the Sunday School basement of Columbus Avenue became a morgue because the funeral homes didn't have capacity for the number no. of dead. And so for several days, the, the basement of the church was turned into a morgue. And the ambulances and the fuel vehicles, as you mentioned, couldn't handle it, so there were station weapons as well as pickup trucks that were taking people out. I am in awe of the open hearts of the people in this community who went downtown and dug, who spent day and night making coffee, making sandwiches, making meals, uh, providing 
bedding for people who had no place to go. And I, I, I think I, I will go back to uh, Julian Huffer's last little paragraph. He, his letter moves me, and it's really scary. At least I think it's really scary. So he gets to the very bottom of the page, of this page. This is all he wrote on the next page. And so that's it. There are many things that could be told, but maybe you have read it. Of course, it's better to leave some things untold. The one thing I can do is thank God for sparing me and those of us here. For it came much too close. And then above all, pray for those homes that were touched and the ones left homeless. It has been like a bad dream, and we hope it will never happen again. It was Friday, this Friday. Uh-huh. I had left my office on the third floor of the museum and went down to where the museum exhibit uh, of the tornado was. Uh-huh. And as I walked into there, there were two men coming out from there. They were by the name of Paul and Gus Sermons. And here it is 60 years and a few days later. They, uh, Paul was in Chris's cafe. He left Waco High and went down and put on his apron. And he was, there was a big horseshoe counter where everybody sat. Uh -huh. And his dad and his uncle were out there serving people in Chris's cafe. When the walls leaned out and the floor fell down and he saw his dad and his uncle disappear. And here it is 60 years later. And I can't imagine the feeling that those two guys had when they lost their dad and uncle. I, I just, and, and it took less than 15 minutes, just, that's and it. that's it. Yep. I have seen a lot of pictures of the tornado damage. I think we all have, though they've appeared in paper and everything. I have up here, uh, this, these are all alone to me, I, a lady in our church uh, saw the, the bulletin that had, says Liz saw the thing and she saw what I was going to do and she brought these to me she said you might find something of interest in here. Yes she did <laughs> I did. I found some very interesting things. If, if you haven't seen the books you might look and she got these online she went online and I ordered them off of Amazon and Barnes and Noble uh, I didn't know Barnes & Noble had used books until last year and I started looking for something and just sort of discovered it. There is a, a, a good coverage in Uphill and Down, which is the National Guard, 143rd Infantry, which was stationed here in Waco. And uh, in that, you know, it took everything after the war. The 36th Division had been demobilized uh, after World War II. And then after the, the war, a little time had passed. I believe it was in early 47. Uh, they started organizing again. And so at that point, then the book, Uphill and Down, takes from just up, you know, after the war because many belonged to an actor that had never been in it during World War II. And so that's the history after a good bit of the coverage. Was Who was this guy, John Bates? Yes. <laughs> he was an yeah. officer. Right? He was commanding officer of headquarters company. But we didn't know a thing about it. He, on um, Sunday was Mother's Day, our families came to us to celebrate Mother's Day. And John and W.C. Haley 
were trying a case over in Russ. So they had to be there early Monday morning. So they went over Sunday night. And they were coming back. And they stopped in the hair uh, to have a Coke, quote unquote Coke, <laughs> with John's mother and dad. And if they had not stopped there for a visit, didn't stay long, but if they had, because they wanted to get to the office and check the mail that had come in on Monday. And if they hadn't stopped there, though, they would have been right in the big middle of it. And, but when they got to Waco, Waco Drive, the, the bridge was there, but it didn't go all the way out. You had to cut over to Elm. And so they came in and they saw damage. Goodness, there's been a storm. <laughs> they got to the bridge, a lot of the holes were down. What in the world would have happened? Instead of going downtown to the office, let's go home. So John took Haley and left him at home and then came on to our house. And he said, well, everything seems to be all right out here, but they've got a big storm over in East Waco. And I said, well, you know, uh, my mother called. <laughs> the lights all went out. And I said, uh, mother called TPML from her house. And they told her all their windows were blown out. That was on Austin then. And they said all the windows were blown out. 900 blocks of Austin yeah, Avenue. Yeah. And, well, uh, and, and it was a real danger to go downtown because gas was still escaping. Glass was everywhere. Bricks were everywhere. Um, well, I was around right. our church, slate came off our roof, and slate and nails were in the parking lot, and uh, it the was National Guard <laughs> immediately went into effect, and the uh, city called uh, martial law, mm -hmm. and uh, even 16, 17 year old Explorer Scouts who have white hair now. <laughs> were called to be at 2nd or 3rd in Austin Avenue directing traffic mm -hmm. and trying to get people to leave town. Yes. And, uh, you know, but people did, I don't know where the word martial law comes from, but people did martial. They did come together and it was we. It didn't make a difference of gender, mm -hmm. uh, race, whatever. Everybody pulled together. And the city was run, not from City Hall, but from the First National Bank in the Amico Building, mm -hmm. because the Amico Building had its own generator. Mm -hmm. And so for several weeks, the city operations took place from the mezzanine of the First uh, oh, National God. Bank. Well, I tell you, at our house, which was out near Hillcrest Hospital, at our house, uh, I was out that, that day about noon. I stopped at the cleaners, and the lady at the cleaners said, Did you know a tornado's headed for Waco? It hit San Angelo, and it's coming straight for Waco. I said, No, 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 I lived here all my life. There's never been a tornado in Waco. I think you were incorrect. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I went on home. We had two little bitty children. And I went on home and uh, uh, we were getting ready to eat and the telephone rang. It was a friend from out of town who tried to contact John. And of course, John wasn't there. So he called home. He said, I thought maybe he'd come home for lunch. I said, no, he's out of town. I said, uh, he said, well, come on down. I'm just passing through town. Come on down. I said, no, I got these two little ones. I said, we have leftovers come on out here. And so he did. And <laughs> we had a very nice lunch. I had a maid at that time. And she stayed and cleaned up. And, well, he went on his way. And I 
put the children to bed. I went outside and I gathered gardenias from two plants I had just covered. And I cut all the gardenias off because I knew rain would ruin them. And went on back in, the, the maid left. And fortunately, he got out of Waco. The maid got to her house before anything happened. But just the children were asleep and didn't even wake up. The rain and the hail came straight down. I didn't shut any windows. You know, we didn't have air conditioning then. I shut no windows. It came straight down. That's all. It was heavy rain. And then so much hail, the ground outside looked like snow. So I woke the girls. I said, and they don't even remember it later that little, but I wanted to see the snow out there. I was just really excited about the whole thing. <laughs> oh, you know, oh yes. <laughs> and uh, but my mother called and I said, Oh mother, you got it wrong. We didn't have any wind. I didn't even close the windows. <laughs> it all came straight down. I said, we did have hail. Now maybe they're hail. Not the wind is out, but we didn't have any wind. <laughs> and uh, but John got there, and he was relieved to find everybody all right. And of course, the park town, he came on out, cut over to um, uh, like uh, Hillcrest, and came on that way to our house. And uh, so he said, well, I still need to go back town and check the mail. So yes, the girls and I went up. So we got in the car, and on the way down, he said, "I need to stop for gas." <laughs> he said, I'm, "I'm getting low all that trip that the driving got." So uh, we stopped for gas, and when we went into the station. A car came wheeling around in there, and it was the wife of his administrative assistant, who was a full-time army person. And she said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm going up with gas. <laughs> what are you doing here? She said, don't you know all downtown is blown away? No. I said, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and so we went on down. And he, but they were in the medical arts building there on the corner of Ninth and Austin. There was a little restaurant right down, you know, on the ground floor there. Well, it was shut. But I, you know, maybe well, that was closed for the day. We drove up into the building, John's parking place, though they have the garage in the building. And so uh, we drove up there and John said, I've got to go down to the armory, which was at six and uh, Frank. He said, I've got to go down to the armory, find out what in the world is going on. So anyway, because she said the National Guard had been called out. And uh, so anyway, we got in and he just took off. He didn't go off to the office. He said, go up to the office and wait. Do not try, you and the girls, do not try to go home. And did you have any money? No, I didn't even bring a purse. And he said, take this money and eat downtown. He said, do not <laughs> try to get out in all the traffic and <laughs> wait until it, you know, leaves. So uh, I said, okay. Went in, and there was a policeman standing in the lobby. And he said, lady, you can't go up there. I said, they're only on the third floor. The girls and I will go up the stairs. No lady, you cannot go up there. <laughs> and he refused to let us go up. So we walked out the front door, and there were people streaming up from the downtown area. Some of them I knew well. And I said, hello, what in the world happened down there? They didn't even look at me. They were in a state of shock, I think, because they had been down there, and if they weren't in it, they had seen it, and they just passed by. But uh, John finally got a jeep and came home quite a bit later. He came home to change into a uniform. But
they couldn't leave downtown until they got things kind of organized and got the chief. And so they had Austin, I believe it was. It was right downtown, too, over toward the river, wherever they were. And uh, they were saying, we, we might have a mother. Yeah. <laughs> 